Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming today um, for the first brown bag of the semester. I'm going to give us a little introduction of digital storytelling. Um, to be honest, I hadn't even heard of digital storytelling before I started this job a year ago. And then after working with Dr. Despain over here, um, we've been looking into a lot of projects that use it. So this is kind of the big overview of what I've learned in this process. And um, if we want to get more in depth on other things um, later, we can always follow up on another brown bag session. But this is just, like I said, kind of the big, broad strokes of what I've learned about digital storytelling. So there we go. All right, so basically, Digital storytelling is a process in which you take all sorts of different multimedia things like videos, oral histories, podcasts, and you can overlay the media, combine it to create um, a project that is digitally shareable. It's usually a short video with um, some different aspects of data visualization overlaid with pictures, first person narration. I mean, it's usually about three to five minutes long, and it's all about kind of creating that narrative and telling a story, and which um, kind of separates it from other things. So it's not really just an oral history, it's not just an interview, it's just not, it's not just a video essay. What's really important about it is kind of centering around the storyteller, um, creating some authenticity and, you know, from a place where they really feel in control, um, they're creating this narrative that's important to them, while also bringing in all these different elements to create a very succinct, emotionally connected um, story that doesn't kind of have this um, decontextualized third person sort of, um, aura about it or is someone, you know, kind of conducting them and steering them in a very specific direction. Um, there's always, you know, you have, can facilitate, but it's not like, here's a series of questions you are going to answer and give me the response and I'm going to steer you towards that response type of thing. So, kind of, most of you probably know this kind of thing already. There's been an evolution of storytelling over time. We started with the oral narrative. Um, it's kind of the origin of storytelling. It's very performative. It relied on memory and recitation, passing it from word of mouth. Um, and repeating, and it would change because of that. Um, it had a variety of uses in teaching lessons and um, relaying information. Um, there wasn't a lot of constraint to it because since it was just repeating and reciting, repeating and reciting, you could bring in all sorts of different changes or shorten it or lengthen it, but it was very in the present, very in the now. You couldn't refer back like you would a book. Um, you were kind of stuck with whatever you were being told at the time. And then, of course, we move on to written narrative where we've got this very deliberate construction. It's where you first start to see more nonlinear because you can refer back, um, look and see what's happened before. If there's like a minor character or something, you can step away and come back to it in a way you couldn't before um, unless you, you know, found the storyteller and were like, hey, can you repeat that one specific part of that story exactly like you did that one time? And then um, you can also have a more gradual pacing and build up. And then now we're, what we're talking about is creating this digital narrative, which is a kind of mishmash of both of these things. Um, you also depend on the participation of the listeners. Um, getting feedback is a big part of um, digital storytelling because you're creating kind of this physical product as well. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on co-creation, collaborating, making it a process that you go through together is just as important as the final product. Um, it's based in media where you can bring in, like I said before, pictures, you can bring in um, video, narration, music, all sorts of different things that you can layer. Um, there's a lot more broad and easier distribution because a lot of times now you can put it online, have it accessible to anyone who would like to take a look at it. Um, and also, um, if you want to go present wherever, it can travel and always be exactly the same. And there's a variety of different approaches. Um, you can make it as interactive as you want. You can make it, I mean, while technically it's usually about three to five minutes, you can make it as long as you want. Um, there's just a lot more variables that you can incorporate. So, but once again, it all comes back to the importance of the narrative. While all of this digital stuff is really important, especially, you know, Iris is a digital humanities center, that's a little bit of what we focus on. Um, what we really need to take into consideration is helping people through the constructing of the narrative itself, um, because that influences everything that happens afterwards. So first we've got, you know, the formation of identity. When people are telling these really personal stories, it's often something that really stuck out to them, changed them in a way. So you're really looking to how someone structures a story about themselves what formed them as a person. And then when you construct the narrative around it, you need to stay true to that place. Um, otherwise, it's no longer really the storyteller's own story. Um, and it also shifts from a place where a lot of times people see themselves as the consumers of stories because, you know, it's easy to go get some form of media, some sort of book, but it's focusing on shifting them into the form of producers where they can take a look at all these different things, but giving them like, hey, you too can create these things. You can make them what you want them to be. Um, obviously, if you're using them in a classroom or something, that changes a little bit, but it's really the idea that they have control over the situation, um, which kind of ties into the agency. 
Um, you really want the storyteller to feel like they have a say in what's going on, especially if you're dealing with things that happened in their life, real life situations. Um, and if you're trying to give them the power to create this narrative that's, um, it doesn't have to be linear or whatever, but kind of focusing around what changed them, it's really important that they decide how that's portrayed. And then also keep in mind this does influence your audience. So what place of emotion do you want to come from? What do you want to convey to your audience? Because in that short amount of time, emotion will tell a lot. So if you don't really nail the tone, it can throw things off. So it's really important to staying in that place of authenticity with your emotions so that you can you know, stay true to your story while also making sure the audience doesn't take it the wrong way. So there are several different types of stories. This is from Joe Lambert's book, Digital Storytelling, Capturing Lives, Creating Community. He's kind of the father of modern digital storytelling. He's part of Story Center, which is located in Berkeley, is kind of the parent organization. Um, if you read any books on digital storytelling in the process, they're all citing Story Center in the books they've produced in their website. So you'll probably be seeing a lot of that um, if you look into it. So the first kind of story at the center we have is a me story. And in me story, it's really about that emotional intimacy. They usually suggest not using that in a classroom um, because you are you know, going into some very intimate places with people. And a lot of times it refers back to something that was really formative for someone as a child. Um, and it's really that changed their life. It's about their um, you know, self-identity, how they express what makes them them. And it's embedded in that very personal experience. Um, and they do suggest that it is a good place for after school activities. It's just you have to make sure you're in a cohort of people you trust. Um, so you're not really betraying that sense of um, this is something really important to me and everyone needs to take it seriously, um, which you can't always do kind of in a classroom environment where everyone's necessarily required to be there in a way. But we also have the my story, which is similar. Um, it's more of an outsider looking at a subject. It's still your story, but it's often about a relationship or a specific event instructed by kind of taking a step back in like viewing it from that place. Um, you're more like acting as a witness instead of just saying this is exactly what happened to me in this moment. Um, and it's, but it's still coming from a very authentic place as you constructing your personal narrative, how you um, experienced an event, what changed for you. Um, then there's also our story, which is more from a place of this is something that happened to us, a group of people. Um, it's cap about capturing that shared experience um, oftentimes it can be more general because you're trying not to step on the toes of, you know, putting too much of yourself onto a story that's representing multiple people or a group of people. Um, and you can use your opinion, but you don't want to come from a place that's like, I'm the authority on the situation and I'm dictating how the story happened for everyone. So it's kind of, you have to keep a level of objectivity in there. So another type of story is their story. This is what you get a lot with journalism when they um, are creating some sort of digital media. Um, you have to be really aware about projecting on a story on a subject that isn't yours. So making sure you take, once again, just another step back and realizing that, you know, if you're telling a story about something that doesn't really, isn't really you, you can't project your emotions onto that and try and influence the um, consumers of your story in that way. And then there's also this outside thing that's not even in the circle, it's called no story, which is something that sometimes can happen when using it in an educational context, purely because you've decontextualized something. It's almost like creating a video essay where they research and kind of slap together media on a subject without really kind of creating that narrative arc and, and shaping it so it's really meaningful. Um, and it just tends to happen a lot where people are like, oh, I'll take this video clip and this video clip, throw some pictures on it and call it a day. And that really takes away from what the essence of it being a digital story is. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, so this is something that Story Center suggests when going through the process of creating a digital story. It's, they literally just call it their seven steps lecture. And um, if you do a what, um, workshop with them or something, they'll go through all of these at the very beginning. It's kind of the whole process from inception of the story idea to the creation and distribution of your story. So step one, owning your insights, is very much about sharing what's happened. Um, it's a very unique and powerful process. It's one of those things that brings out a lot of emotions in people when trying to create that narrative. Um, and it's not just about the event itself, but you're looking with people who are trying to tell you the story. What was the event of it that caused, the, what was kind of the catalyst for change? What life lesson did you learn from this? What, um, why is it important that you feel like you need to create it into this sort of narrative? And um, it's more really about getting the um, why of this question. Like a lot, we talk about this a lot in Iris with the digital humanities students. A lot of us really care about that why, not the what, which is sometimes hard for us to connect to these um, things, but it's processing out loud and getting to the real root of what is happening in your story. 
So the other part is owning your emotions for step two, and it kind of ties to that because you're looking with how it's entwined with your insights, what sort of emotional resonance you're going for with your audience. Um, and it's really about conveying it without cliche because, for example, if it's for an assignment or just trying to express you, you don't want to take from these you know, standard ways of expressing your emotions because that's not really going to get your story across. But you, you know you can refer to those for your help, but um, it's really about finding that authentic you voice in the story. Um, so step three is about finding the moment where you're pinpointing that exact um, you know, moment where you know, something decided changed for you, what really is the focus of your story, and trying to get through what are these you know, external events that may have happened because of it, but what's the real point and lesson, and why is that moment it? Um, and it, your story doesn't necessarily have to be a single moment, but um, keep in mind it's that really short format, so you don't always have time to um, you know, list out a bunch of moments, but you don't have to combine it to that single one. And it's really about showing rather than telling the moment, because if you're just there and like, this is a thing that happened to me, ta-da, you know, it doesn't really affect your audience. But if you're building up like, you know, this is all the elements that went to this one lesson in my life and here's some photos and videos and everything, it, it creates a completely different um, identity for yourself within your story. So next is often what comes the seeing your story moment and you're learning how to describe it with images um, and also thinking about, you know, yes, I can take it, if I, it's a story about my family, I can have a picture of my family. But if I'm talking about how my family makes me feel, I might use a symbolic image. And I'm um, really getting around, like it doesn't have to be this black and white literal thing. But um, it can have layered meaning. You can use multiple ones, just finding really what speaks to you through that thing, rather than this is what I think people want to see when they're hearing about this story. Um, so next five is hearing your story, kind of straightforward as with seeing your story. Um, it's about conveying your tone, connecting as the narrator. Um, they often suggest trying to have an unscripted conversation before writing it down because that really, you know, when you're, just, for example, just talking to a friend, your word choice and things is often different than when if you're sitting there trying to write a script because someone's going to hear it. So just trying to get that feel of what words really express you in that situation. Um, so six is assembling your story, which is what um, a lot of us are probably concerned with when it comes to the digital storytelling um, and learning about it is that the kind of idea of like making sure you have an outline, spreading out your notes, making sure you have this general idea really assembled in a way that you can see if you need additional details, if the pacing um, needs to improve to fit into that three to five minutes, and you know how you, know, you have these sounds and these um, images now, how you want to layer them and what makes sense in that regard. So then the last element is sharing your story which involves um, considering the best way to present to your audience, because who is your audience? Is it for a classroom? Is it a single person you're hoping to share it with? Or are you standing up and giving a presentation in some sort of event? So those are all things to keep in mind. And like, for example, if you're just posting it online, does it need context? Do you need more information? Or can your story speak for itself? Just analyzing any of those things that might be considered shifts and um, kind of convoluting what your story's trying to get across and making sure that you don't need anything to um, explain what it's doing. So another section is before we get to the more digital stuff is the first part is really important is actually facilitating the story circle um, because if you kind of just let people put things together pell-mell that really influences the kind of product you get and if you're trying to come out with this really um, true to yourself story just you know slapping me together is not going to work. So step one is you always clarify the ground rules. Um, in Story Center they um, usually do this after the seven steps I just mentioned and really laying out, you know, this is a respectful process. If you're doing it, for example, in a classroom, you know, this is confidential. You can't go around telling everyone else's stories how you think it should be told. Um, there's also the idea of protecting the storyteller. Ultimately, they own their story. They have the agency to um, share what they want. Um, if they want to use their entire time in this time just talking it out instead of getting feedback, that's fine. Um, and also letting them stop. Don't push someone if you can see that they're getting to a point where um, you know you might think it's a really great point to add to their story, but if they're not really comfortable with that, you don't want to push them there. So step three is focusing the discussion of the story. Um, so it's making sure everyone stays on top. The feedback feedback is actually constructive. Um, you're keeping on schedule because even though you know it's nice to ha talk about all these things, you still have to get to the actual creating of the physical story. Um, and sometimes you know in groups people tend to get carried away. It's hard to keep on that track if you don't kind of stay firm on that. So that ties into their step four, time management, which is really key um, because, for example, in Story Center, um, they're offering, often giving a workshop that's one or two days, and if they spend two days talking about the process of creating your story, 
you don't really get the actual story creation. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, making sure the step five is shaping the process of feedback, making sure you're supporting the storyteller in a way that, you know, they can tell their story, but once again, making sure something is being produced, um, maintaining order, making sure things are going in a method that's actually helpful and constructive. Um, step six, you need, they often suggest you identify a broadly applicable lesson because when you have people sitting in a circle talking, they tend to build off of each other. And um, by drawing that broad lesson, it kind of brings everything back to a point. And it's really helpful in just facilitating keeping things going and making everyone feel like they're getting some sort of individualized attention in their feedback. Because obviously you can give individual feedback, but um, that way it just makes sure everyone feels like their story is being responded to. And then step seven is kind of summing up everything that's happened, um, making sure everyone knows the additional resources available to them as they continue on with the process. Because the thing with the storytelling is it's ongoing. It's not just a bam, 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 do this. There's always room for feedback. There's always room for adjustment. So this is kind of probably what a lot of you are more interested in. Um, this is from Samantha Mora's website on um, using digital storytelling in education. And it's more of the steps of actually creating rather than talking out your story. Um, so there's always, you have to come up with the idea of the proposal. And for example, if you're using it in a college classroom or something, there has to be some level of researching, exploring, learning. Because even if it is your own narrative, there's something you can learn from it. There's tie-ins, there's other things you can bring into it that relate. It doesn't just have to be, you know, flat out, this is how I feel about something. Um, and then step three, you write or script it, and then you go on to the storyboarding, laying out everything that's going to be coming up. And then you can gather your images, any audio, video, music, of course, you can use, but you have to keep in mind copyright, especially if you're publishing things on the internet. And then, you know, there's the process of putting everything together, synthesizing, layering it, editing it in some sort of video editing software. And then um, sharing it is a big part. So if you're in a class doing the presentations, showing your professor or something, and then making sure people get their feedback and reflect on the experience. Because kind of just making it and being done with it doesn't really do anything. You need to have that time to, you know, share how people respond to it and have the person reflect on, well, okay, this is how I told my story. Is this the way it still needs to be told? Is this how I want to tell it? What, what's the meaning behind this? So, next, something that's really, really important is the ethical considerations behind digital storytelling. Um, this comes from the Story Center website, um, and it carries through almost any book you'll see on digital storytelling. And once again, the storyteller well-being is at the center of the process. For example, if you come up and you're asking, like, tell me about this really traumatic thing in your childhood, you can't just, you know, kind of leave it there. If you bring up something, you can suggest, you know, you know, because obviously you're not necessarily authorized or prepared to talk to someone on a very, like, therapeutic level. So I'm um, making sure if you do bring up those kinds of emotions, knowing where you can point someone, making sure they're informed in all the steps of the process and they really know they have control in the situation. Um, so the next big thing is consent and story sharing. Um, just because someone produces a video and shares it with you doesn't mean you get to send it around. Um, the storyteller really needs to know what is being sent around, what is um, what other people are having access to, and you need to make sure they always know the version you're sharing um, because it's the final version of what they're willing to put out may not be an earlier version you might have. So it's just being sure that you know what's being actually put out there about the storyteller. So we've also got um, knowledge of production and ownership because ultimately they are creating, um, you don't want to think of it in terms of the product, you're like distributing, but ultimately there is still something, a finished product at the end. And um, being making sure it's, once again, confidential. Um, you're flexible within how it's being shared. They know where it's going, um, what's happening with it, um, whether or not they need to um, express how their privacy should be maintained, outlining kind of the context in which you're sharing their story, if it's going to be in a classroom, if it's being in a presentation, if you're just putting them on a website. So another really important one is need for local relevance, because a lot of times people are going into the community or going into communities that are different from theirs. And if you just kind of show up and tell someone how to do something in a way they're not familiar with, that really defeats the purpose and the importance of sharing a digital story. So making sure you're constantly um, looking for people who are local as well, especially if you're working somewhere where they speak a different language, um, making sure everyone is informed in their own language, having local partners who are familiar with the situation, making sure things are culturally appropriate, and also just to make sure you have the right resources and equipment, because not every place you might conduct a digital storytelling project will have the same you know, amenities that we might have here on SIUE's campus. So another thing to keep in mind is ethical engagement is always a continual process. Um, for example, if like, you know, 
few weeks later, the storyteller comes to you and is like, hey, I realize people are seeing this I'm not really comfortable with anymore. You can't just keep it on the internet. They have the right to revoke that and um, protect themselves in that way. But also just keeping an ongoing dialogue of what the goals and objectives are, what um, recruitment and preparation you need, sort of the materials you need, what the privacy guidelines are, and how um, your support is being provided is really important for them to know. And then lastly, story distribution. Everyone needs to know where their story is going. They need to have a copy of it or at least see the final version of it. Um, and make sure that if you're putting something sensitive out there, that um, if it might be something that's triggering to your audience, um, you can't just show up and you know, put a very graphic image without warning people, making sure you keep that in mind as well. So once again, I'm just going to revisit that the storyteller is the key to the process. It's very hard when you come from a background where you might be conducting um, like an interview or something along that line, you really want to steer in a very specific direction, but that's really kind of defeats what this whole thing is about. So really keeping in mind that the storyteller is in full control of this process and um, that it might bring out some emotions, so you need to be aware of that, especially if you're giving them you know, a specific talk about you know, leading into a certain area, maybe about childhood or something, that things might get emotional, and that's okay, but also you know, not undermining that, but also not trying to take on the therapist role. Just do what's best for them. And also keep in mind they can revoke their story at any time. I know things are different, like if they're doing it for a class project, but also in that way you can lay things out very clearly at the beginning. They know what's coming. It'll influence that. So here's an example of a digital story from Story Center. It's from their Silence Speaks project. Um, they did it in partner with the Afghan Women's Writing Project. It was published in um, 2017. And um, in terms of what I was saying earlier about whether or not your video needs context, the only context given is that it's about yearning, gender bias, and oppression, and the determination to resist. So. So that is just one example of many ways you can um, do a digital story. As you can see, it kind of she chose to focus on that symbol of the bike to really get those points across. Um, this was something I actually showed to the DH Club and they found very powerful, which is why I chose to share this one. Does anyone want to share a comment, question me? It's fine if you don't, just they really wanted to talk about it after they watched it, so I wanted to give the opportunity to you guys as well. Okay. I think it's really impactful for mm -hmm. simplicity. Yeah, and I think that's what um, I really enjoy about the digital storytelling idea as well, is even though it's this really condensed thing, you can really pack a punch to it if you do it the right way. Anyone else have anything you want to share? Mm -hmm. really powerful with the digital um, sort mm -hmm. of thing as well, because when you can't do that in writing, you can either have translation or in the original, but here you can do mm -hmm. both, and so you get kind of the original view and mm -hmm. the audience can understand. Thanks. That's that idea of layering, and you can do so much with that. Right, yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay, we can always come back to it if you want to talk about it. But, oh. Okay, so now we're going to kind of get more into the nuts and bolts of things, which I'm probably sure a lot of you were here for in the first place. Um, so here's just a few digital storytelling tools. I tried to focus on um, open access or free ones just because I know it's a lot. Um, there are some places where you can, you know, hey, buy a preloaded iPad with all these apps and we can create these things, which isn't really, you know, a reality for a lot of people if they want to create a really, um, if they want to create digital stories, especially on a large scale if you're doing it like in a classroom or for a club. So just a few things. Audacity is um, a um, audio editing software that you can download. Um, and you can just put it on your computer and use that. iMovie, most of you have probably heard of. It's the Apple um, video editing software. You can download it on your phone, laptop, and do things there. Um, Photoshop isn't free, but we do have it in Iris if any of you want to do a project. So I wanted to include it there. And it's also fairly common. Um, and then Premiere Pro is Adobe's video app application for um, editing and kind of moving things around on a timeline. Iris also has that, not free, but you know, if any of you want to come use it, you can, just let me know. Um, and then some other interesting tools that kind of go out of just the plain, um, just a video image or anything in layering, is we've got StoryMap.js, which is a free tool where you can highlight locations of a series of events and create your story through kind of this location-based um, image. Um, I haven't used it much, I played with it a little, so I don't know um, from first person, but a lot of the reviews were good of it, and I saw it in several places. It seems to be popular among teachers. Um, and then we also have Timeline.js, which some of you have used, and it's creating an interactive multimedia timeline, so it's just kind of a different way to show your story. And then down here we have WeVideo. WeVideo is not free, but it's kind of considered, um, they partnered with Story Center, so now it's kind of considered the, the digital storytelling software. 
um, but it's really not something that's necessary. But if you're interested in it, you can look on their website. They've got plans and everything. Um, but like I said, I wanted to try and focus on the things that we had available to us here or that are just free. And of course, there's a million different versions of it. Um, some people still use Windows Media Maker, um, things like that. So if you have anything that can edit audio, um, video, any sort of photo software, you can really build what you need. Um, it doesn't have to be anything incredibly fancy because as we saw what the power comes from, is it, even if it's simple, um, just building it and being coming from that authentic place. So just a little bit on digital storytelling and higher education. Um, a there's kind of this you know, new book on it, um, higher education and digital storytelling on the international scale. And what they really did was based it around Boyer's um, 1990 model of scholarship. And they broke down how um, digital storytelling can be used in all these different areas. So for the scholarship of teaching and learning, you know, you can talk about what a digital story is, um, what the boundaries of the genre are, um, experience how you can reflect on a digital story and learn through that process. Um, then we have the scholarship of discovery in which um, you can use them in research. A lot of um, medical um, students use this to get patient perspectives, um, just record things that have happened in their studies, um, and establishing kind of this idea around public research projects and um, making the digital story important in uh, the way in which you figure things out. Um, and then we have the scholarship of integration in which you can um, look more closely at the effects of digital storytelling. A lot of times people will make it as a training tool, reflecting on their own experience, then sharing it with people who are up and coming in training and kind of actually integrating it into that sort of curriculum. You can also look at it in the idea of it's um, a good way to collaborate and make new programs and record that process, um, document it for people in the future. And there's also um, examples of libraries that use it to document how um, they interact with students, how students respond to certain ways. So just really making it a part of your day-to-day -day interactions and what you do. And then um, the last one they kind of adjusted, it's act they call it the engagement, um, the scholarship of engagement and collaborative practice. And this is the concept of taking it outside the university, um, going into your community, um, helping others create digital storytelling, giving students the opportunity to both create their own digital storytellers of how they operate in their society, but also um, empowering other people to do so as well. So that's just kind of an overview of how um, a lot of the digital storytelling big scholars right now see it integrating into high ed. Um, and then, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about digital storytelling at SIUE, some of the projects we're doing through IRIS. Um, so in collaboration with ROE 41 and the Manny Jackson Center, um, Jessica Despain is the PI for the um, Conversation Toward a Brighter Future. It's an NEH access grant. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go into local schools and work with teachers on um, working around this idea of intergenerational communication and how um, students construct the idea of themselves and the relationships of adults based on age and those stereotypes. And it's gonna be accompanied with a um, curriculum involving novels, art, history accounts of how um, people of different generations interact and just how their perspective can be conveyed through different ways. And that also kind of ties into the honors um, class she'll be teaching in the fall. So if you need more information on digital storytelling, Jessica Despain is the person to go to. Um, she's our expert. And so what we're going to do. <laughs> but um, she's also going to focus on that idea of aging and constructing a narrative and those connections in your life and how um, you really take these moments and, um, and especially how it's um, colored by your, gener um, your generation or your age at the time and um, exploring how it appears in all these different genres and um, subject areas. And then also the Digital Humanities Club, which is a new club for the um, college um, students here at SIUE, is looking into ways they can maybe go out into the community and work with um, different um, groups. We've talked about maybe going to nursing homes, going to VFWs and things, and trying to help people um, construct stories that are important to them and provide them with a place to express that and then maybe create a website if they're willing to have it shared um, to you know give people from these different situations um, ways to relate to each other in a way they might not be able to otherwise. And also, um, there's also digital humanities clubs run through Iris Center that um, we have a few students. Gabby, Gabby works with the students. Raise your hand, Gabby. <laughs> and um, the, the, so, well, yeah, I'm gonna talk about yours, but um, so there's a, um, DH Club that um, Dr. Spain and Dr. Ramsey run with um, students from East St. Louis, Madison, and Venice, and they're also doing a lot of the elements of digital storytelling. They're still in the process of creating podcasts and audio editing, but they're really building up those skills that they would use to create a digital story. So a few different resources. Like I said, Story Center is kind of the 
home base for all digital storytelling. It's located in Berkeley. It used to be called the Center for Digital Storytelling before they just kind of shortened it to Story Center. They have a lot of initiatives, um, like the Science Speaks one, that, that video was from, was one of them. And they're really um, focused on helping people get the equipment they need, facilitating workshops, um, kind of helping people learn how they can facilitate a digital storytelling circle and then actually make the product. They offer a lot of webinars. Jessica and I have actually done a couple of them. And they also offer workshops that you can bring people in to do. Um, the webinars, for the most part, are free, so that's the what I do. are really expensive. Yes. So we stuck to the webinars. But, mm -hmm. um, and then also the um, College of Education at the University of Houston. They have a very um, comprehensive website on digital storytelling, specifically in education. Um, it can span from you know K through 12 to higher education, and they're teaching their um, college students to use it and bring it to the classroom. And they've got lists of software and equipment that's really useful. Um, different readings you can do, directions to other websites that are very, and you, they also have contact information, so if you have questions about using digital storytelling in your classroom, they seem pretty happy to help with that. And then also, of course, I'm going to plug our own site, iris.siue.edu. We've got a methods page, which kind of has a digital storytelling section where we suggest different um, readings to look into, um, kind of methodology behind things rather than our resources page, which lists what we actually have in the Iris Center. Um, if you want to use, for example, Premiere Pro or Photoshop, you can take a look, see um, what equipment we have, what you need, and then you can always contact me, and um, I can set up a time for you to come in and work with that. Alrighty. So looking to the future of digital storytelling, the interesting thing about this is that all of these elements are already kind of out there already, but these are the ones that really seem to be on a forward trajectory and really gaining popularity in digital storytelling. Um, so the first one is gamification of storytelling. Um, we're getting a lot more into people, you know, portraying themselves through virtual reality. Um, there's a little bit of backlash from this, you know, um, stereotype of what a gamer is, and, you know, that's not really serious work. But they can really do a lot more now. Um, one thing, they, one example they gave in the book that I have cited down there, the new digital storytelling, is um, younger kids are using Minecraft in story mode to create tell their own stories and what's important to them and really get their emotions and actually recording that. So that's one interesting example, I thought. Um, and then people are also like, you know, sharing recordings of role playing, how they envision event going about um, and asking for or playing games that ask for their response to something and then capturing, you know, how they feel about it. So kind of almost in a way um, directing a little bit more how they tell their story, but still getting it out there. Um, that also ties in a little bit to automated storytelling. You're getting more and more um, software, especially for like K through 12 classrooms, in which um, there's a bunch of preloaded content that they can remix into how they want the narrative to go. So kind of all the elements are already there for them. They just have to see how they want to um, express that. So it also, there's programs where you can get an email prompt that kind of gives you, you know, an example of what you should maybe talk about, and then you can record things that way. There's um, also a variety of websites and everything that kind of try and prompt you along the way so you don't have to go through the facilitation process but can do it all online on your own. Um, obviously, we already you know, deal with mobile storytelling on a day-to-day -day day, day -day, um, way, but there's um, more and more apps that are moving from this idea of purely consuming the stories and capturing the media, media to actually editing on your phone or mobile device. Um, getting a little bit more sophisticated and putting those together in one um, central location instead of often, you know, moving it to a computer and then trying to sort it out there and then sharing it through an app that, which then people can look at on their phones. So that's something people are more and more interested in developing apps and things for that. Um, another one is increase in collaboration. Right now, a lot of digital storytelling software, the problem is this one single person, for example, if it's an online account, can edit it, and then you're locked out and can't work together. So a lot of times it falls to one person doing the video editing, one person maybe doing the audio editing. So this idea that you can maybe share a link and you know, work from different places instead of or you know, taking a hard drive and passing it around. So trying to look forward into how, um, with more and more collaboration going on, how you can make that work for multiple people without you know, also conflicting making conflicting copies or something like that. We also have the um, further incorporation of social media. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we've all been around a while, really, really popular, but people are trying to look for ways to directly pull from that and tie that into a digital story because a lot of times on social media, you know, people are really telling what's happening to them in the mode and what's going on. So if they can tie that information together into a digital storytelling, um, people are looking how they can do that in an almost more automatic way without people having to, you know, go screenshot that or type it in separate um, in a way they can pull directly from that. So that's the general overview. A little bit rushed in there, a lot of information, but does anyone have any questions? <laughs> any questions? Yes, Christine. How important 
important is the writing process in digital storytelling creation? So you mentioned that um, that people are encouraged to um, talk out their story ahead of time before they write a script. Um, I would be interested in hearing about situations where they talk out their story and then tell their story without actually writing it down. Yeah, I think that happens in some instances, um, especially the ones I looked at that are like um, where there's maybe language barriers or something where someone's facilitating but have it to the translator. Um, but a lot of times I think, um, like for example, in videos and stuff, they focus on that and not really the writing process. But um, I know in an educational context, they really try and encourage the writing down because I think that's just another element to hand in. But I don't know if it's, you know, once again, this is all about storytelling, so I think it's a little bit more flexible than, you know, I know we have all these charts and like seven steps, the eight steps, you gotta do them, but. I like a lot of those steps, but I, in, in the world where I collect stories, mm -hmm. well, other than work that we would do here in the Metro East, people are um, not formally educated mm -hmm. and they don't read and write, or they don't read and write in their native language. Yeah. If they do read and write, it's in another mm -hmm. language. And so they still tell stories and they mm -hmm. still, you know, tell really mm -hmm. awesome, you yeah. know, gripping stories, mm -hmm. um, and so I was, but they may not, the, yeah. those stories might not follow a concise narrative mm -hmm. flow that we might expect to find yeah. in something that's been converted to writing. Mm -hmm. so. And I think um, that's what kind of they mean in the local relevance of ethics. I was going through fast, so we didn't spend as much time on that, but it is, you know, kind of taking into consideration what is norm for the locale, because ultimately that's what's important. If your storytellers operate in a way different than you do, it's they are the priority. So if they do operate in a way in which they um, are going to do it purely orally or orally, that's fine too. There are articles on that reference that um, that doesn't discount their story in any way. It's just I think um, when they you know create the structured thing, they're trying to cover everything. But it's not like they discourage doing that. Well, then comes the ethics of the editing process. Mm -hmm. And how do you? I mean, if you're handing that off, we to don't edit else, the narrative. No. The people tell. The people so we ask like them. Moral history yeah, we ask them to. Um, first of all, give us their permission orally before they tell a story, and then they watch the story after in its unedited, rough form, often off the video screen, which we flip and play for them. And if they're okay with the story as it was told, then we go with it, and we often, when we, what we archive in, in the language documentation project is that unedited, rough story from start to finish. So they, it might not have kind of the quite, the tight, cohesive yeah. kind of, um, Product. Yeah, yeah, or, 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 yeah, yeah, or yeah. plot flow yeah. that one might find, yeah. uh, even in the mm -hmm. example you showed us. For yeah, I was going to say, because um, even though that's why mobile stuff is becoming more po um, important, but also it is too, the storytellers generally are, if possible, the ones editing it. Um, they don't like send them off anywhere. Um, but like I said, it depends on what equipment and resources you have, how mm -hmm. it ends up. But just because it's not the fancy equipment doesn't make it less important than the other ones. And a lot of the, the work that Katie and I have been imagining um, part of the reason why we like the idea of intergenerational storytelling is that there's this divide related to technology too, where sometimes the young feel as though they have some kind of a leg up in technology as opposed to older generations, but older generations feel superior in other ways to younger generations. And so it would be this way for them to um, share the things that they know with one another through the process of storytelling so that everybody <coughs> would be involved in the editing process. It wouldn't just be the one person tells a story and someone else edits. It would be young people facilitating the storytelling process and then helping um, older people learn how to edit that using digital tools. But that one's just not a bad idea. It's just not official yet, so I didn't know how I was supposed to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Kerber. In a real broad, open mm -hmm. question, how would you compare this practice? I'll use the word practice the practice of oral history? Well, I think what they um, primarily identify as the difference is that oral history can be obviously a part of digital storytelling is the idea that um, a lot of times with an oral history, I feel like there's some sort of direction often. Um, for example, um, they might go in asking about a specific event or um, the context of the location or there's kind of this idea, very specific narrow idea, not necessarily narrow, but just like track you want to be on with an oral history oftentimes. In digital storytelling, it's kind of up to them like they can talk about what they want. There's no questions necessarily going on. I mean, there might be a prompt or something if they're struggling, but it's really about what comes from them and what they want to talk about, not someone like, for example, I'm doing a project on Madison, um, the history of Madison County. Can you tell us about your experience in Madison County? It's more, you know, what's important to you? What do you want to talk about type of thing? Does that answer your question? You can do oral history of a place that does the same thing. It's just mm -hmm. open-ended. Yeah. And so then the question is really like, are the methods that different, or is this more mm -hmm. Creative storytelling, I mean, digital storytelling can be applied in the mm -hmm. fictional world. Yeah. 
I think a lot of its origin is in more like arts type of things. So I think it is the idea of the creativity. Um, and I also, um, I mean, oral history can be a component of it. So it's not like it's two completely different things, right? Um, and it's also that idea of layering media. So um, once again, the oral history can be a component, but it's not really, a st it's not, um, it's part of the bigger process. It's not just the standalone thing. The other thing I, I would add to that, that I think is really important and the most distinctive difference is, and Katie's kind of talked about this, but just to make it even more clear perhaps, with digital storytelling, the point is the person telling the story. So the point is what they get out of the experience of learning how to tell their own narrative, as opposed to learning something from the narrative they tell. Yeah. So it starts from the other angle. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to speak as someone who's done a work with oral histories in the past and has learned digital storytelling through people that I work with. <laughs> um, it just, the practices are similar, but oftentimes the goals are different. Mm -hmm. Not always, of course, but with oral history, the goal is to get information from the person preserved in some form. So it's, the goal mm -hmm. is preservation of a story, whereas mm -hmm. digital storytelling, this. Yeah. The story is sort of. Yeah. That's why there's four slides on storytellers instead of the making of the story. Right. Yeah, I think part, part of what I'm interested mm -hmm. in is um, to help people think about why their stories matter for themselves mm -hmm. and for other people and how that can help mm -hmm. us learn to communicate better with one another mm -hmm. as opposed to mm -hmm. let's remember this moment in history. Let's talk yeah. about Pakistan. Because also that influences, um, you know, the way of how someone sees themselves versus how they think they should be representing themselves through some sort of cultural, you know, institution or existing narrative. Yes. I was wondering if you had any um, guidelines or directions for the storyteller. So mm -hmm. sometimes people have amazing stories, mm -hmm. but they don't quite know how to articulate them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, do you videotape them initially? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, unedited, this is what you want to say. Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, let's look at this. What mm -hmm. else do you want to say? Do you have any more mm -hmm. detail? I'm really interested in this part. Or yeah. is, there, is there anything that the well, other person does mm -hmm. not to change their story? Mm -hmm but allow them the opportunity to edit if they'd like to. Yeah, that's kind of the, um, in the kind of story circle process, they're hoping that um, people will give feedback to each other. And also that's why the feedback stage at the very end is really important because um, that gives them the opportunity to go back and change their story once they see what's clear to them. And it's always checking in. Um, you can do, you know, this isn't like a cut and dry, this is exactly how, how you have to do it kind of thing. But the hope is, is that by you know sitting in kind of that community and talking it out is they will help shape their stories on their own without saying, you should probably talk about this. And then since there is that big element of feedback versus like grading or this is the final product, you know, because once someone sees something, it's a lot easier. So there's the idea there's always the room to go back and get feedback. Um, I didn't see anything particular about maybe like recording the story circle itself. I and mean, that might have to do with like, you know, um, confidentiality and things. But um, I don't see why if the like person wanted to record them telling their own story, why that would be a problem earlier in the process, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Anyone else? Yes, Liz? I have kind of a boring question. It's just a tool's question. Okay. Um, I promise I wasn't just here for I mean, well, we were expecting to have more tools by now, so this was initially going to be like a tools workshop, and then it wasn't. No worries. <laughs> it's all great. Um, I'm just curious. I've, I have students using iMovie um, in one of my classes for their final project, mm -hmm. um, but I haven't been able to transition the, the project to only using vi creating video because I am I've, I haven't been able to find something that is not Apple equivalent of the iMovie. Is there something that I'm missing? Is it one of these tools that you offered? Um, not Apple. Well, the thing is, a lot of people still suggest Windows Movie Maker, um, which isn't really still being produced in the same way as it used to be. So I don't know. Um, I think that would depend on whether or not someone has it. We recommend Premiere Pro because it's what we have in Iris. Okay. Um, if you want, I can take another look because I have a list of equipment I've been looking up in um, software I've been looking up in my office. I can take another look at that and see what I maybe and send yeah. you a list of that. It's just so cool, um, but it's not equal right now because some students don't have access to that in particular format. So. Yeah, um, and there are some suggestions. Yeah, I'll take a look at that and I'll send you an email because it's just it'll just be better if I look at the ones because I actually have like a list where like things are ranked and what's useful, what's free. So I don't want to suggest something to you right now that might not be. Yeah, 
Thank you. That's really the whole thing. Yeah, it's very familiar to the Windows Maker, but yeah, it seems like Microsoft doesn't isn't working. Does it have break still available? It's not for editing though. I think it's just for reformatting. Yeah, handbrake is formatting video. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. taking certain types of high def files and turning them into MP4. Oh, I yeah, see. Yeah, it's for video conversion. Wow. Yeah. And also there are some softwares, you know, where you can do it, try and create a game or like a pop-up storybook that they aim at younger kids, but um, that's um, a little more of the pre-loaded content type of thing, where they just kind of manipulate what's already there. And I think even like YouTube has some very basic editing once you upload yeah. the file. I could be wrong about that though, so don't, yeah, but then again, don't once, consider that verbatim. Yeah, well, once again, what's important though is, you know, coming back and it's being a storyteller, so they try not to, but yeah, I think right. the app monopoly is, is a little bit of a problem in some instances, because um, a lot of the digital storytelling stuff I did come across just assumed that it's all Apple products. But for example, in Iris, we use, um, deal with a lot of local students who use Chromebooks. Um, yeah. So you know we have to find software that's, because um, I think Audacity is yeah, Audacity doesn't even work on Chromebook. Chromebook. So there's a lot of trying to find you know comparable Audacity software. Does not work on Chromebook? It does not. Okay. So um, what, what was the one you ended up using for them? Soundtrap. Soundtrap, yeah. Yeah. So. Which you can use on another computer too. But yeah. I, Half of what Ben and I do is finding alternative things that end up not working, so. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone, you're a great audience. <laughs>